Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Friday night interview program. And it's a great pleasure to have with me tonight, Brother Daryl. Welcome to this Friday night interview program. Uh oh, guess what I did? Great pleasure. Either I or you have uh, not muted the Daryl chat room portion. I think it's you. Yeah. Yeah. So just go ahead and mute that. That way we won't get. Uh, I know my words are very, very profound and they should be repeated. You get it? <laughs> Yeah, I got it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I muted the the other one there so that we don't get the loop back. Okay, very good. I don't think there's going to be a necessity for us to mute our microphones. Usually, if there's only two people, you don't get a lot of feedback, and uh, the audio quality is usually good. But if we find that uh, the audio quality uh, drops, uh, then what we can do is uh, start muting our mics. I see Brother Leo Larson's there. Hey. Brother Leo, uh, he's driving home right now, but he's going to, I guess he can hear us or something. Let me see. Hey, Leo, how are you doing? Talk, text, look forward to listening. Okay, he's going to be able to listen as he drives home, I guess. So Brother Leo Larson is with us. He's already been examined by the uh, Inquisition Board uh, in a previous interview. Yes, that's right. I listened to him, too. That was good. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, uh, DFX Daryl, that is the name of your YouTube channel. Well, if you want to call it a YouTube channel, it's just it's just a, a way to actually get on in the in the chat room here. That was that's the way you got to do it, right? So technically, I have a channel, but there's nothing on it. Yeah. All right. So you have a channel, but uh, I guess is there a reason to ask people to subscribe to your channel then, if you're not putting up any content on it? No, actually, not right now. Uh, okay. I haven't. I don't have a lot of time for it, and God hasn't really led me to do so just yet. So no, not really. All right. Well, we know you're providing to all of the other uh, YouTube uh, players in our community here. You're 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 contributing uh, by uh, participating in all of our programs. So yeah, you, you, you are providing content, but just not on your own channel. That tells me that you're not on some kind of an ego trip, where it has to be about oh. you and your channel. Nope, not at all. All right. Uh, okay, you know what to expect. I'm just going to uh, start at the beginning, brother. And of course, the purpose of this is um, I want to get to know you better. I've I've had a lot of private talks with you in the in the private fellowship room uh, over the last uh, few weeks that that's been up and running. Uh, but I'd like to get to know you better, and and also I I, I it's my hope that all of the me regular members of our congregation uh, that these interviews will serve to uh, help us all get to know each other a little bit better. And uh, when I say regular members of the congregation, uh, if, if you're if you're regularly participating in some way in the talk and doctrine programs and the Church of the Eternally Secure programs and and uh, you're a regular viewer participant, particularly if you're participating much in the chat room, uh, these are the people that I'm anxious to, to interview. Okay. Okay. So, Brother Daryl, uh, we do know that you live in Canada. That has already been revealed. Uh, but where you live and, uh, and other things like that, uh, it's a mystery and it will remain a mystery. But I'd like to know if it's not being too personal when you were born or, or what is your age, if that's not too much to ask. 1970. 1970. So I'm, I'm 48 years old. Four, 48, yeah. yeah. You have a very young sounding voice. And let me talk about your voice here. But first, as I see people popping up here in the chat room, I want to say hi, hi Anna and Nabob and uh, Leo. Oh, I'm sure we'll have more people who join us as, as they become aware that we're, we've started the live program. Uh, so you're, you're 48. And. <clears throat> I, there are three people I've known on YouTube that have a very pleasing voice. And uh, you know Brother Cripps. Of course. Um, and, and I don't know if you know Brother Scott Evans. I've known him for 
probably eight or nine years, almost since the, my beginning on YouTube. And he doesn't do that much on YouTube anymore. But Scott Evans, he was a former professional radio uh, personality. And so he had, he had a radio program and he uh, has a trained radio voice. And like Brother Cripps, their voices are very soothing. And I find your voice very soothing. Well, that's interesting, Luke. Uh, that's kind of an answer to prayer because when I first started this, like I had no no intentions on being on any show, broadcast, or podcast, or anything. And when I started helping out on Talking Doctrine on uh, Monday's Milk, uh, the devil was trying to get in my head, and he was trying to, uh, you don't, you don't really have a place here. You you don't know enough of the Bible, and you know your 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 voice is not right. It's it's you know. Everyone thinks their voice sounds ridiculous and whatnot. So, you know, I pushed that aside and I just kind of pushed through and whatnot. But then, then you popped right out and said that. So I do appreciate that. Well, I don't know. I mean, maybe, uh, maybe um, other people might be hearing your voice differently than I do. And but to me, I just love the sound of your voice. I don't want to go on too long about that because we got a lot of other questions for you. But uh, you don't have a trained voice then like a, a radio person then it's just a, a natural way you speak uh yeah yeah i i've had to work on it just a little bit to, just to kind of get the timing right and everything as far as interviews go but that's it yeah okay all right uh so i've got you by 20 years i'm 68 and you're 48. Um, you don't have to call me sir because <laughs> i'm older okay uh how about grandpa yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Gramps. You can call me Gramps. Uh, actually, I guess it depends on how it's intended. It could be a, an affectionate term, or it could be uh, like uh, taken offensively. But I try not to take things offensively, if unless it's clear, clearly for the <laughs> intended that way. Um, all right, now you live in Canada. Does can we assume then that you were born in Canada? Yes, sir. Born. Okay. Born and raised here, uh, haven't moved too far from my uh, my original home. My parents still are both. My parents are still alive, and they live well ten minutes away from me now. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been it's been great. And uh, I guess you can call me a Canuck. Americans like to call me can a Canuck. Uh, and it's now right now thirteen degrees Fahrenheit. Just in case you're curious. Thirteen degrees Fahrenheit. So that would probably be. Uh... 26, roughly 30 degrees. Uh, uh, oh, well, 13 degrees Fahrenheit. I thought you were. Fahrenheit, yeah. I've, not, I've already done it for you. You did the math for us. Okay. Yes. That's very cold. That's, that's uh, I'm, minus I'm 11 Fahrenheit. Celsius. <laughs> okay. I've been um, uh, almost a shut in the last three or four weeks because uh, I just don't want to go outside unless the weather's really perfect. And if it's, if it's below 50 here, Fahrenheit, then uh, I, I feel it's too cold to go outside. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to me, it is. Sure. 45 or 50 degrees Fahrenheit was probably, you'd love to see that, that weather, huh? <laughs> um, okay. So you, you were born and still live. Have you lived anywhere else, or is it your entire uh, life has been uh, living uh, in Canada? Nope. I've been here the whole time. Never, never left. Uh, I guess you could say, uh, well, I guess I can tell you that I work at uh, Boeing. I make airplanes for a living. And uh, as of January 2nd, uh, I've been doing that for 30 years. 30 years anniversary for that. That's uh, that's good. But And they and they said about you that you could never hold a steady job. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't true at all. No, not many people can can ever boast that they uh, were employed by a single company for thirty years. That is showing great. Uh, um, I don't know what to call it. It's not yeah. really. If you like your job, it's not determination and persistence and stuff. But it's. Uh, I guess you've been very content and never felt the need to change. Exactly. Well, I've been. I, I call it blessed. <clears throat> I've been blessed. Blessed with a good job, with with good pay and benefits and vacation and all that stuff so i haven't felt the need to no to go okay. anywhere else so well, let, let's go back to now to the to the beginning here uh, 48 years ago you were born into a family okay can, can you tell me a little bit about your 
your family when you were first born? Is, is it a two parent family and are there siblings? And One sister. I got an older sister, two years older than me. And uh, yeah, well, that, that answers that question. <laughs> both, both parents were there raising you? Yes. Now, yes. I, I, that probably, uh, it, it is a sad thing that I would have to even ask such a question. Yeah, true. But from my age, it's a lot more common from someone my age than it would be anyone younger than me, obviously. But uh, yeah, I would say that my parents' generation, uh, there was a commitment to stay together. And uh, beginning with my generation, the baby boomers, as we're called, uh, we became very selfish and thought, well, if I'm not completely happy, uh, I'll leave. And uh, there was no real uh, commitment or uh, what's the word uh, when you, I guess it's a commitment to, to your marriage and your family. But uh, <clears throat> so you have two parents and was, were your, are your parents and were they uh, Christians? And are, what kind of Christians if, they, if so? Well, my my mom, my mom was actually she uh, she grew up in the church uh, and she went to a small Baptist church not too far from here, which is still around. It's actually that one celebrated a, a, an anniversary in 2014, 100 years. So, so that, that one's been around a long time. Oh, let me turn my phone off. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, she grew up in that church and. Uh, and my dad, my dad is not, to this day, he's still not saved. And that breaks my heart the most because he is such a great man and he's been such a rock to me. And I just, it just breaks my heart to see him. I, I can talk to him about a lot of things and, and talk, talk to him about God and this and that. But uh, he, he, and I've come straight out. I said, well, what's wrong? Why can't you, you know, receive or whatever? And, he, and even he doesn't even know. And I believe him when he says, I don't, I don't know. I just don't know. But uh, yeah, my mom. She was she was the, the rock for me as growing up. She was a she was always praying for me and taking me to church, taking me to that little Baptist church. I have great memories of that of that place. So, and uh, your father's alive now. Your mother is still living today too. Yes, they both are. Okay. Uh, when you say your mother was a, a a Christian and she was in the the, the Baptist church there. Uh, can you remember at what point uh, you got any kind of instructions, the earliest instructions you got as, uh, as a, about Christianity? Oh, man, I, I'm not good at going, going back. I know you like to ask the question, what's your very first memory? I have a tough time going back super far, but uh, uh, my mom, I guess, just, just praying for me, uh, you know, prayers before bed, going to, going to Sunday school. You know, that typical life that most, well, I won't say most, but a lot of us did in, in back in that time. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah. Go ahead. So, but uh, what you learned as a child, what was about the Bible and Christianity, was it from your mother or was it from a pastor or how, how did you first start gathering information about uh, Christianity and, and what, what, how was it represented to you if you, if you can recall? Yeah, that would be right from the church itself. Uh, I don't recall my mom ever really sitting me down and preaching me, the, giving me the gospel. Uh, she always, she always prayed, prayed at home. She had her Bible and she would read. Uh, it wasn't super central in our home, but it was always there. The foundation was always there. And I always felt safe, and I didn't mind going to church. I love going to church. So I guess the, the majority of, if you want to call it doctrine back then, <laughs> going to Sunday school and whatnot, was coming from coming from the, the church itself. So, Well, when you're very young, at what age do you remember going to church? Was it 4 or 5 or 8 or 10 or roughly what age can you recall attending church and getting instructed? Mm, probably... Eight, eight to ten, probably. That's what I, that's what I remember. Did they, did they let you attend the actual congregation sermon, or were you set off in some little small group with children? No, it was it was a small group with children and whatnot. Not until I was probably I don't even know how old. 
maybe 12 or something, 12 or 13, 12, yeah, maybe 12 or something. I, I actually came into the congregation and they made me sit there and, mm -hmm. and even, even at that, I don't, I don't know, you know, you're a typical kid, you are, sometimes you pay attention, sometimes you don't, so. Mm -hmm. Exactly how much I was getting out of that, I don't recall. <laughs> you can, uh, can, can you remember uh, any of your uh, early uh, Sunday school teachers? No, actually, I don't remember the Sunday school teachers, but I do remember a cute girl that I really liked. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and and, and yeah. it freaked my, freaked my parents out. <laughs> it gets me back to my first memory. It was a real cute little girl named Susie in, in kindergarten, and I... I bent her over like a movie star, bent her over and gave her a kiss in kindergarten. Oh, that's, that's my great. earliest earliest memory. Wow, you were more brave than me. I, I just gave her a present at Easter time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, your your Sunday school teachers must not have had a, a great impact. Uh, I, I mean, it's, or it seems to me, otherwise, you know, the things you tend to remember are the uh, this really significant things, There's something that's really very wonderful or some bad, really bad experience. Well, while I'm on that subject, let me ask you that question I like to ask everybody. Can you identify, and just, you had to think back, what is the earliest memory that you could recall? What, what age and what was the memory? Yeah, I heard you ask uh, Alex that last time. So I was trying to think myself. I knew I was going to be on here eventually. So I'm like, man, I, my wife is, she's, she's amazing. She can remember stuff back to when she was like two or something like that, two and three years old. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, no, I don't remember that. But I do remember um, just goofing around in, in front of the family, you know, as a little boy, just show, showing off, trying to show off my skills. And I could just, I could stand on my head, right? <laughs> so I stand on my head in the middle of the living room and just show off for as long as I could. That's my earliest memory. <laughs> oh, that is funny. Yeah. <laughs> And that's, so that's a pleasant experience. Uh, that's a fond memory you have. You betcha. I'm glad. To, I'm always glad to hear that rather than someone remembering some really bad thing that happened as a child, and that's that's the earliest memory. But from my experience asking a lot of people that question, it it, it tends to be a dramatic thing. Either something they really it's it, it's memorable because it was good. Or it's memorable because it was bad. And you know what, Luke? I do, I do hang on. I do remember getting getting my first Bible, uh, like just a, one of just a little Bible. It was probably even a King James at the time. I don't have it anymore. I wish I still did. But just having my own Bible was, I th yeah, I think it was just a New Testament. But uh, I'm sure other people can can relate when they're kids. They when they get their first Bible, they're so proud. You feel you feel a sense of pride and. You don't have a clue what you're looking at. You don't have a clue what you're reading, but it's mine. I got my own little Bible, so that's a nice memory too. Hmm. Wow. Um, that's interesting. Uh, I was given this Bible here. I've got a lot of Bibles, as you'd expect, I guess. See, yeah. my last name is exposed to the world now. <laughs> but, uh, this is a Bible that my son gave me as a gift. And I've got Bibles, gifts from numerous people over the years, but I was never given a Bible as a child. It wasn't really part of my uh, family and my upbringing. So it's interesting that you you got a Bible as a gift as a child, and that's very memorable to you. Um, Actually, you know what, Luke, what I, just, I just remembered now that you said that, uh, I, I do have a Bible, uh, a picture Bible that I was given uh, I guess it was to my sister and myself, and it was it, it was a great thick picture Bible, and it went right through all the all the different stories and everything. And I, that one I still have, and that one's really really good. Wow. Yeah, that's a, that's a nice memory too. That's great. Huh. Um, well, I find it interesting that uh, you attend Sunday school regularly. How many years do you think that you actually attended Sunday school as a child? No, basically right up until I was, uh, I didn't leave the church until, well, like most, or like a lot of people, they kind of backslide out when they get to their, uh, I think it was about 18, 18, 17, 18 by the time I stopped going, or maybe even later, I'm not even 100% sure, but yeah, so I was there basically the whole time. Um, well, it just, it seems to me, it's, it's hard uh, for me to comprehend that I, I, I'm just wondering, were the Bible of the uh, Sunday school teachers there primarily then babysitting rather than instructing you? Did you get any instruction from any of your early, uh, you know, Sunday school teachers that you can recall? 
Well, you know what? I guess I did, and and whatever was given to me, it's it stayed as a foundation for me. But it, it didn't. It wasn't huge. It wasn't a. I don't I don't recall getting a whole lot of getting or getting the gospel even properly. Like now that I know the fullness of the gospel of grace, that's the thing, right? I don't recall ever getting that proper fullness of that as a kid. I don't think I ever did. It was more of a, hey, hey, be good, uh, you know, here's Noah, here's the flood, here's David and Goliath, here's this, here's that, here's Jesus, here's the cross, and, you know, they would give you the, kind of the understanding of the cross, but not the fullness of it, of it right? Okay, so I'm, I'm risking jumping ahead. I don't want us to go ahead and, and, and uh, neglect a big portion of your life, so uh, we're going to get back to this point uh, that we're on, but sure. let's jump ahead and tell me then, if you don't recall... Uh, receiving the the actual gospel message as you understand it today, uh, at what point did it act, that actually become clarified for you? What, how long ago was that? I don't know. It depends who you talk to. <laughs> <laughs> if you, if you, if I talked to my, if I asked Matthias, it was probably only six months ago or something. <laughs> but uh, no, um, that's. That's really a tough one. Uh, are you asking me when I got saved, or? Well, that's the next question. Is uh, okay. Let me go ahead and ask you that because uh, do you believe that you were saved when you were a child, or did you do you believe that you didn't either have the right information or all the information you needed, the right kind of understanding and faith until some point later? And so, you know, tell me about that. I don't. Oh man, that is a tough one. I, because I grew up my whole life thinking I was, and then later on down the road, after spending my life outside the church from 18 to probably 30, early 30s, I was living living like the world, right? And hey, let me uh, let me stop you because yeah, I won't go too far. <laughs> I don't want to miss. I don't want to miss something you said that I believe is really really profound. And let's let's uh, I want to. Let's let's uh, focus on that. You it, said that you always thought that you were. Now, my question is to you and all the viewers also, is that isn't that what we want someone to do to get saved? We want them to think, believe that they are saved. Isn't that what we're, we're uh, asking people, expecting of them is that an understanding and a belief that they are saved. Isn't that what the, the, the our that the, we're supposed to be getting out of this gospel, the, the belief that it's done, I'm saved, I'm confident of it. And, and so if that is the, the, the case, then uh, perhaps when you're much younger, you were confident that you were saved, you're going to go to heaven. Is that, am I? Yeah, I, I guess I, 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 I thought that. I remember, I remember thinking back and yeah, I, I thought I, thought I was and uh, but I remember at one time thinking I had it all figured out I don't know how old I was but I was I felt really good in my flesh that you know what I got this all figured out I know who God is I know this I know and I got it all figured out I remember really feeling really good and confident in myself and then and then well that was probably a false conf confidence uh, maybe I don't know like and that's the that's the weird part Luke I honestly can't tell you when I got saved Mm -hmm. so I don't want to go too far ahead, but uh, let me, uh, let me uh, stop you again, because when you uh, I one thing that I think I do pretty well, if I'm going to pat myself on the back for a moment here is I do listen very well. And uh, it was sometimes maybe I make too much of a single word that said, but you just said you think you, you, you had confidence in yourself. Now, you, we could take that and that you had confidence in, in yourself in that you were. Um, you, you, your, your place in heaven was assured to you, uh, or you could, I could take that to mean that you had confidence in yourself and that you could go before God and say, I'm, I, I know I've done enough. I believe I've done enough. <laughs> how, how should I take that statement by you? No, maybe more like myself, uh, but not really necessarily having the fullness of the understanding of it, right? Just kind of knowing, uh, yeah, I know God, I know Jesus, I know, uh, you know, I, I was thinking in my head, oh, yeah, I'm going to heaven, and, and this is all great, and all. Well, but, let, me, let, let, me, let me rephrase it and try to get to this uh, uh, another way. Um, 
uh, let's say at age six or eight or 10 or 12 or 18 or whatever age you want to think of, uh, any of those points, if you died, assuming that there is isn't uh, uh, an age of accountability and you are beyond it and now now you're uh, expected to um, to receive the, the gift. If you had died at that point and 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 as Jesus said, there'll come a day when people will come to me and say whatever they say in his in his story, he said, they'll say, look at all the wonderful things I did. And uh, but if if you had died at that at a younger age, and that day came where you, Jesus is saying, asking you to pl to plead your case. I know we don't really have to do that. I don't believe we have to do that. I think we're, we're it's already determined, so we don't need to have it determined if we're saved or not. But just for the, uh, the idea of uh, understanding of what you believe, uh, would you have ever gone to, to before the Lord and said? My plea is only the blood of Jesus. It's my, my plea is Jesus did it for me. My plea is that he's promised me eternal life. And that, that's my only thing I'm offering you. And if, as in the, in the gospel song, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Uh, or at a, one of those younger ages, do you think that if you were in a place to defend yourself, present your case, that you would have presented the, the case to God that I've been pretty good. It's, you know, thinking that it's based upon how well you've done. How, how would you have uh, presented your case to God at these various ages? And that could probably tell us, I think, that would indicate to me at what point or what age that you actually got, got it right. Well, you know what? I don't recall ever, ever thinking that it had anything to do with me. Uh, I I would just I just assumed uh, like like that it was Jesus uh, uh, that I believed in Jesus right so it was always uh, I guess you could call it a I don't know if it would be decision no, it's not decisionism it's just it's just a you know what I believe in Jesus I accept you know the, the old school way of accepted him into my heart sort of thing uh, now nowadays we really got to split those hairs and say okay what do you truly mean by that but back then it was okay i'm believing i'm receiving and and i i could very well have been saved back then and then just backslid into the world for that time and, and then came back yes yeah uh, I, I we it's very very common for us i believe to overcomplicate all of this and uh i think i could condense it down to it did, did you come to the point where uh, you, you you were convinced that you're going to heaven and it's it's guaranteed to you by Jesus because only because of Jesus and that's it um, and you know whether whether you're praying or whether you're going down an aisle or, or however this plays out but in your mind you have the belief that I'm going to heaven only because of Jesus. That's how I would uh, scrutinize this. Yeah, my mine was a very simple faith. It was just a faith, my faith like a child, and I didn't get a lot of doctrine. Uh, I didn't get a lot of stuff that filled my head full of uh, any like there was no Calvinism, there was no Arminianism, like none of that stuff ever crept in. So that part I'm grateful for, mm -hmm. and it was just a, a simple faith that hey, this is Jesus, you know. <laughs> so. Yeah. I guess I, I guess now now that you made me think a little bit harder, yeah, that yeah. could very well be the case. Well, I know that Brother Leo's uh, making the point about uh, children and uh, his uh, they they have to they just have the most basic faith, and I think even as adults, all we're really required to do is have the most basic faith. Uh, we don't need to, as I would say, you don't have to become a theologian to get saved. You don't have to know a lot. You don't have to get all your ducks in a row and all your facts straight necessarily. I think you just need to believe that you're you're guaranteed heaven because of Jesus, because of Jesus. And then who he is, what he's done for you, and all the other details about that. Uh, uh, I, I think there's plenty of time for people to study and learn and get all those details just right. But if a person is at any age, now, Brother Leo's, Think, thinking about children, but my question is is not necessarily as a child, but at some point in your life, 
you, if you were to go before God and say, what's your plea? Well, my plea is the blood. That's all. Nothing else. Nothing but the blood. And, and uh, at what point in your life would that would you have uh, made that kind of a plea? Okay, that would be quite a bit later in life. That would be after I had come back from uh, from my okay, we'll call it the prodigal son type thing. Come back, come back to the church. Uh, God drew me back in. We'll get to that later. But uh, I, uh, yeah, I kind of, I guess, re I guess the word back then would be rededicated. I rededicated my life. Uh, you know, what does that mean exactly? Well, I just, you know, just start focusing again on God, and uh, and then. It really kind of hit me that okay, yeah, this is what I need to do. I, I I'm I'm broken before you. Uh, you know, I remember laying on the floor in my living room, just kind of broken and and just crying out to God and just kind of getting it all out. And so, yeah, so I was probably in my early thirties then. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I don't want to overthink it and over over analyze uh, this, but we do know presently. And maybe in the not too distant past, you said maybe at the age of 30 and you're, you're, uh, you're 48 now. So um, maybe the middle of your lifespan at some point you, you understood and believed uh, correctly. So we know that is settled. That's not an issue. Uh, I'm just, uh, I like to figure out um, how a person uh, grew up, in, in their conditions in their home, because a lot of people believe that they got saved as a child. And uh, and then some people would say you can't be saved as a child. And, and uh, at some point later, when you are able to intellectually understand things better than at that point in time. But OK, let's move on. I want to know a little bit, if you don't mind talking about your sister. Uh, did your sister have the same kind of experiences in a, a church attendance? And were you uh, like collaborators as, a, as she's two years older than you? Did, what was your relationship like with her and, and also with you and your sister at church, was she part of this too? Actually, my sister is awesome. She is absolutely awesome. She, we, my parents were blessed because uh, we always got along. I, I only recall one time, I don't even know how old we would have been, one time that we actually fought. We always hung out together. We, interestingly enough, we had the same job. We worked at Burger King for, I worked there for three years before I went to Boeing. I went from Burger King to Boeing. I've been there 30 years now. But uh, we worked together in there. She met her husband in there. Uh, we, yeah, it was, my, I have great memories of my sister uh, hanging out a lot. And uh, what else? And in church, yeah, yeah, we all, we both went together and grew up in the church together. So that was a, that was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, we eventually, when I got uh, baptized in 20, I don't know, 2011, 2012, something like that. When I finally got baptized, I got to do it on the same day with her, so that was real special too. Okay, that's wonderful. I noticed in the chat room that this subject of Brenda has come up, uh, so let me, I, I should have mentioned this in the very beginning. Uh, I know that I had announced, announced um, on Sunday that uh, tonight I would be interviewing Brenda Z, and uh, she, she contacted me and said that because of her children and being the time of night, and it would just be too hectic and possibly uh, uh, it, it, she wants to do this at a later date, so hopefully we'll reschedule this down the road. And thankfully, uh, Brother Darrell told me that he would be available if there was a cancellation so he could fill in. So <clears throat> I'm thankful that you could do that and, and uh, for the opportunity for everybody to get to know you more now. Uh, now, tell me about... Uh, I. Did see a comment there in the chat room from you, Brother Daryl, that you uh, you're not so much into hockey, being Canadian, but you're into motocross. So, uh, as a boy growing up, what kind of interests and activities? Uh, how did you spend your time recreationally as a boy? Yeah, you bet. I love I love my motorcycles, especially dirt bikes. I uh, <clears throat> got my first one as a child. I don't know. I was probably six. And it was just a little, just a little, little pull start deal, one with a, with a, what do you call it, a lawnmower engine on it, and I was hooked ever since. And I probably had about ten different bikes over my lifetime. Got a couple of little mini bikes right now. I don't really have anything. I had one, uh, one street bike that I 
a few different street bikes, but one that I kept for 15 years and would go on long road trips. It, looked, it was Kawasaki, but it looked like a Harley type thing. And uh, yeah, I grew up as a kid uh, racing motocross. So that was, uh, that was a whole lot of fun for me. And that was my main focus. And that was one thing that actually helped me stay out of trouble. Like there was all the other kids that were going out and causing trouble and doing this and that. And I really wasn't interested in, in a lot of that, but I would just leave me alone. I'm going to ride my dirt bike. So that was good. Yeah. Wow. Um, my best friend growing up, uh, he lived next door to me and I was two weeks older than him. So we, we grew up like twin brothers and we did everything together for, for many, many years. But he, um, uh, he got a, a little motorcycle once when he was about, you know, let's say 13 years old, 12 years old. And, and he just, he's driving around and he said, Hey, drive it, ride it. And nobody even taught me how to drive or anything. said anything. I, I didn't get any instructions. I got out and started driving it. And the first thing I did was drive it right into the back of a parked car. <laughs> Man, that happens a lot. You, well, just watch America's Funniest Home videos. You see a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but I've 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 never been um, one that uh, who's uh, uh, a um, used motorcycles uh, either for transportation or for fun in any way. But it uh, seemed like a very could be a very fun and exciting uh, hobby or activity. Uh, you said that you uh, you raced it, so you got into competitions. Yeah, actually, uh, when I was about sixteen, I think I raced, and I raced for five or six years on about three. No, two different dirt bikes that I had uh, over those years, but yeah, it was a whole lot of fun. Uh, extremely hard motocross. People have no idea who's never who've never ridden a dirt bike before how incredibly hard it is. It is so. It's second only, I think they've said to soccer as far as your endurance needs to be, or maybe even more than soccer somewhere in there. But anyways, it's very very difficult. You're using all your muscles, and your heart rate is very, very high for a very long time. And usually, it's in the middle of summer when it's very hot. <laughs> wow. Yeah, uh, I don't know about the the, the viewers here if, if they're surprised by that. Maybe they just know more about it than me. But that's that's a surprise to me. I, I, I mean, I, I could and I could visualize doing it and thinking that it would be very strenuous, but I I hadn't really thought it out to figure out how how difficult it would be. Uh, and then also you have the the danger of it, the risk. Um, so was that part of the appeal to you, the ex excitement of the, the, the danger? Well, I don't like getting hurt. So no, I didn't care for that part of it. <laughs> but I think that's what made me not so good a, a racer. <laughs> <'Cause>, uh, <laughs> I wasn't one of those guys that was fearless and would just fly over anything and everything and just do stupid things, right? I had, maybe that was my conscience. Maybe that was God speaking to me while I'm racing. Okay, just back it off just a little bit. Don't do this. And, and kind of protecting me maybe. I don't know. But I never got hurt. I never, well, I got hurt, but I never got seriously hurt. Never broke a bone or anything like that. So my experience in racing was nothing but good. You know, I I can't prove it, but I suspect you're right that uh, th that was God's way of keeping you safe because he had plans for you. And uh, I think what you're doing tonight and, and all your uh, contributions to our congregation is, is part of that plan. So he preserved you and kept you safe. Uh, I have no doubt about that. Yeah, I got, I got to, I don't know if you want to, want to tell those stories now, but I do have some stories of protection. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I'd like to hear them. Uh, anything to do with the motorcycle or we got, you want to move off of that? No, uh, the bike, well, just, just okay. That. No, just just it was, it was something else. It was you know with a with an ex girlfriend, uh, a girlfriend's ex boyfriend. Uh, uh, he chased me down, and there's kind of a bit of a story there where I was protected there, and there's there's some other stuff. But all right, I'd like to hear these stories. I think everybody would, and I, I I've got a a, a video called um, Signs and Wonders where I talk about maybe five or six different miraculous events in my life, and I hope everybody will begin to share. The miracles in their life and these things like a story of that you felt that the lord has protected you the uh, i do i do think that god is keeping us uh, uh for his purpose uh and that's why i tell everybody uh, don't waste your ministry renee just talked about that I, yesterday i think in one of her videos that what a shame it would be to be saved and then 
not fulfill the purpose God has for you. And he has a plan for you. Uh, he has work for you to do. But it's a kind of work that's a labor of love, really, when you, when you really get into it. Um, so, yeah, well, I'd like to hear. I think everybody would like to hear uh, your stories. Go ahead. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so I would probably be about 15 years old and working at Burger King at the time. Uh, I met a nice met a girl there, and she had just recently broken up with a boyfriend, so everyone knows what can happen there. The ex is still hanging around and a bit of a looney tune, apparently, and uh, I didn't even know the guy. I didn't even know what he looked like. I wouldn't know, know him to see him ever, and uh, so I guess he found out about me, and, you know, we were we were just starting to see, date or whatever, see each other at the time, and uh, sure enough, this guy finds out where I live, and... Uh, I'm with a friend of mine in front of my house. He had just left. My friend had just left on his BMX bike. I was on mine. And I was going to go in the house, and this guy shows up. I don't know where he came from. Like I said, I didn't even. I had no idea until like the next day. Who or did he? No, oh, no. I think he did. He did say something about her name. I think he. Anyways, he came over to me and he grabbed me. He grabbed me by the throat and put me down on the ground and raised his hand in the air and he was about to just destroy me, and he stopped. Just stop dead, and I was and okay. I'm just pinned down, and I'm like I'm, I, I couldn't even figure out who this guy was. And then, and then I can't remember if he mentioned her name. Yeah, I think he mentioned her name briefly, and then his hand stopped, and then he just got off me and walked away. Wow. So, so I look back today at, at something like that, and I can go, okay, he should have just pummeled me into nothing, right? Now I look back and I go, okay, I think uh, there was a hand in that holding his hand up <laughs> from coming down on my face so mm -hmm. that one idea yeah, that's interesting uh, but you uh you probably had some curiosity but probably didn't want to risk following up and asking him why <laughs> <laughs> yeah i just let that go i'm like okay and uh, i never did i never saw him again and, and i just kind of avoided this situation and it didn't work out with her anyway so it was like okay done <laughs> But I've, you know, I've been in, in typical, I'm sure other people have heard uh, accidents, you know, you've been in accidents where it all, you know, almost been killed sort of thing and kind of freaks you out and like, okay, that was God keeping me safe. I should be dead right now. Um, bar, and it's funny because when I was, you know, I, I was a social drinker through my backslidden days and, uh, and my friends were a little more wild than I was. I was always the reserved one. I was always the the, the level-headed one, and always trying to keep keep these guys from going off the deep end. And but it was funny because these guys like they would like to fight every once in a while. They like to fight, but me, I'm a small guy, you know, and and I would get my butt handed to me if I ever did. So I was never that kind of guy. But it's interesting that every time that these guys would get in these barroom ball like brawls in the country like we used to go snowmobiling too in the winter and we would get we would go to these bars and whatnot and but every single time that these guys like there's i remember three or four huge barroom clearing brawls police the whole thing uh you know taking testimonies all this kind of stuff and i was never i wasn't there for one of those and i hung out with these guys all the time i was i was spent more time at their place than i did at my place and uh, his parents were my second parents and the whole thing. And every single time I was not in, in one of those. So I can, I can say, I can chalk that up to protection. Yeah. Wow. I have no doubt about that. That's uh... oh, by the way, while I'm thinking about it um, uh, in the chat room, if you have something that you want to uh, say that you'd like us to respond to, particularly to brother Darrell, put it in all caps and to get it, get my attention, or if you have a question, just put it in all caps, and I'll try to pay attention and bring it to Daryl's attention. Um, all right, um, any, any more stories you wanted to tell us about uh, uh, divine intervention protecting you? Uh, not about protection per se, but uh, I do have a miracle healing, so wherever you want to fit that in. All right, well, let's, let's fit that in at the appropriate uh, time in your life when we reach that point where we're still at the point now where okay you're you started to get into your uh, motocross uh, you got your first one when you're six that seems amazing to me uh, it seemed like that's something that you wouldn't do to your teenager but you started very young with that 
and you, um, so uh, that's continued your whole life. So let's say let's say you're advancing through school. Is that your primary uh, interest uh, uh, for sports and recreation activities? Yeah, that's the main one. <clears throat> I was never good at skating, so hockey. As much as I like to go to the rink in the winter, just you know, on the corner, there's a rink on every corner here in the in Canada. Uh, I was never that good of a skater, and I wasn't that big, right? You need to be a bit bigger, and hockey's pretty hard. But I would just play around with my buddies and that. So hockey was never, and I would follow it a little bit on TV and stuff. But no, I was never big into that. In school, I played basketball, but I wasn't that tall. So, <laughs> and I warmed the bench for two years. So I think I played maybe four times in the two years I was on the basketball team. Mm -hmm. So uh, that wasn't a, a big thing for me. But yeah, the dirt bike was was my main my main deal uh, to the point where. Actually, I'm an artist too, so that 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 was my my big thing is drawing, artists, uh, painting, you, you name it. I, oh, okay. That, well, let's, not, let's not let's not just skim over that. Your art, yeah. Uh, I think the talents that we have are uh, we definitely want to know about your talents, and so that we can use them somehow. Maybe you, you your talents not only can bless us with just the the pleasure of looking at it, but Maybe someone will need some help artistically, and, and now they realize that hey, Brother Daryl has a talent. Maybe he can help me. Yeah, I'm similar. I'm similar to. I'm, I'm giving you jobs that you. I don't know if you're ready to take. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm a lot like Matthias that way. So he he he's very good at what he does. He he can set up. Uh, like I'm not so good at, at websites per se, but uh, that's one thing I never did get into, and I probably should have. But but I do a lot of print media today uh, computer stuff and back then I would I would do a lot of drawings when I was a kid uh, I loved art class uh, and uh, and to tie the two together I actually it was funny what was it grade uh, 10 I think grade 10 I ended up bringing my dirt bike into the school and put it up on a table there and because someone had done that in the past like not that not that long before I went there I saw I saw there was a dirt bike in there and, and they would take animals and, and, and set them around and then okay draw this, you know, they would, we would draw the bike or draw, you know, and so I ended up bringing in my own dirt bike in, into the school, so that was interesting to do. I didn't get to start it up, and so I, I wish I could have rode it around the school, but no, I didn't get a chance to do that. Uh, so is it primarily sketching, uh, pen or paper, I mean, I mean pencil and, or ink, and, and or did you do or any um, painting or sculpting, any other kind of artwork? Uh, no, no sculpting, I was never into that, but uh, I, I, I did love sketching. Uh, I did. I I drew you know, some portraits and stuff. One for my girlfriend and at the time, and uh, just like you know, I, I would draw dirt bikes. I would draw way back, way back when I was young. I, I still got some pictures actually somewhere that when I was probably about six, I would draw Spider Man, and uh, uh, he was my guy. And uh, so I got a lot. Of, I, my mom actually kept those for me, which is nice. Um, and today it, it morphed in, or throughout the years, it morphed into airbrush. Airbrush painting and uh, some some brush painting color, and uh, today it's morphed into computers. And uh, now I do graphic arts on the or gra my graphics on the side, and it's great because I don't have to leave the house. Like I, I used to paint race cars too. I, I'm in, I love race cars. My friend of mine's been racing cars for 35 years, and uh, and I used to paint the cars by hand, sign painting by hand, and that's just. Well, back then it was fine. Now I can sit at home. I can I can get uh, get the get the work sent to me. I can do it here. I send it to the printer. The printer sends it to him, and the check comes in the mail. I don't have to leave the house, so it's awesome. Yeah. Let me ask you: When you say that you used to paint the cars, you don't mean painting on the car itself, do you? You're talking about making a painting of a car or on a car. No, no, I paint, uh, well, either. I, I, I've done drawings and stuff, paintings of cars, uh, but but uh, mostly I started doing painting the cars, the cars themselves, though. So dirt, dirt track race cars. So, yeah, I was doing, doing, doing all the sign, all, like, all the logos and, and the numbers and stuff, yeah. Uh -huh. All right. Now, I know you worked at Burger King, and, uh, and then and then after, what do you say, three years, you get into your career that's, that's lasted all 30 years now. Um, at some point, you met your wife. Are you, you, am I getting you married when you're not? I, I think you are married, aren't you? Yes, yes, uh, 11 years now, yeah. So I'd like to know uh, about how you met your wife and who she is, and, and then, the, then if you have any children. 
Well, my beautiful wife, uh, Pamela, she, uh, we, it's interesting because we met, or we knew of, put it this way, we knew of each other 20 or, well, about 20 years before, 20, 25 years before we actually started dating. Because I worked at Boeing and she was an interpreter for the deaf. And we had uh, quite a few deaf people in the plant at that time. So she was this pretty blonde girl with these funky purses that she would wear around. She, she had a whole collection of like 30 purses. Like one was, a, one was an actual clock that, that was that, that a working clock. One was a working phone. One was a Lego purse and all the, and, you know, and uh, all, and I remember seeing her, of course, pretty girl. And like, yeah, but I knew I had heard that. Okay. Everybody. Yes. She was married before. <laughs> so she was married. So I, I just didn't, didn't bother with her. And, and then fast forward, she ends up in 20 years and she's been coming to Boeing and then about, uh, yeah, so three months before she left Boeing, uh, when left the company that supplies Boeing with interpreters, we actually had the chance to meet. And I found out that she was divorced. And I swung right in there and, uh, and got, well, God had a plan. How's that? So we ended up uh, meeting three months before she left after 20 years, 25 years of knowing who each other was, but never actually meeting face to face. Wow. So, uh uh, that, that, so you worked at the same place for all those years, but she was married, and then after the divorce. So that is fairly recent then. Uh, so we're jumping from yeah. maybe twenty years old until uh, what, what? What age and how long ago was your marriage? Eleven years ago. So uh, thirty-five ago. when we met. Okay, I'm. I'm I want to know all about your your wife and family, but I I, I don't want to miss twenty years of your life. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Can you? Uh, so let's. I don't know what to ask you about that, so unless you all do some follow-up questions, but you, could you tell me what happened during that period of time? You're working at Boeing, uh, you're not married, uh, and uh, are you are you doing anything with your faith at that time, or are you more like a, a closet or a lukewarm Christian, and which is what many people are much of their life? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I wasn't doing anything with my faith. No, I was the prodigal son, I guess you could say back then. Uh, I moved out uh, at the age of 24, excuse me, I moved, uh, I did a little bit of this, I bought my own house when I was, how old was I, that was 1999, so I would have been 29 when I bought my house, and, but uh, yeah, I was wasting a lot of time in the bars and, and all this kind of stuff, but you know what, the whole time I had, I had my foundation, I had, call it, yeah, I guess I had my faith, but I wasn't, I was backslidden, so it just wasn't it wasn't surfaced it was it was pushed under but it was interesting my my, my friends would uh always you know they wouldn't we didn't talk about it a lot but every once in a while god would come up and and i would try and defend my faith kind of and 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 uh, they would mock me right i would just get mocked ah there's that, that ain't true ah, you know none of this kind of crap but whatever they would just razz me about it and it always drove me nuts that i never had a, a uh an answer for my faith so that was a big thing for me that that drew me god used to draw me back in to draw me back to him that hey you know what you need you need to have an answer here so i don't want to go too far again but eventually when when he started drawing me back into the church uh, i ended up uh, going to a kent hovind uh, creation seminar and that really got me excited because he was bringing answers to all these atheists and then mocking atheists and friends that I had. So, hmm. that's interesting. So, uh, there was a period where you, where you did you drop out of church entirely and stop uh, yeah, attending? Yeah, yeah, that was when I left. When I was, when I was like twenty, maybe ish, something like that. Yeah, and then uh, uh, you you talk about you use the word backslidden, and, and you talk about the pro, I know I'm. The prodigal son. Yeah, um, I, I'm. I've said it numerous times, but sometimes I say something and I think it's profound, but it doesn't catch on. Maybe other people don't think it's as profound as I thought it was, but I, I think it's a mistake when you see in the Bible uh, the uh, word, the term prodigal son, 
because the prodigal, the word prodigal is not in the, in the scripture. Uh, so how do we come up with that term? Well, publishers and, and uh, translators, theologians and publishers, they put like titles above certain chapters or portions of scripture to try to tell you the, the theme of that scripture that's following. And it's very, it's universally referred to as the, the story of the, the prodigal son. But what does prodigal mean? Uh, well, we could, you know, try to figure that out. But I, I don't think prodigal, as most people understand this story, is really the right way to see it. I, I think it should be, if we're going to give it a title at all, it should be the, the story of the backslidden son. Uh, that's really what's happening there. But people, people uh, because it's not talking about being backslidden, because people are not using that terminology, it's prodigal. So it, the people are free to misinterpret the, min the meaning of the story, the intention of the story. The intention is, is not to tell us that this person lost their salvation and, and returned and got it back. The intention is he's remained the man's son the entire time. The, fa the father never disfellowshipped the son. But the son was backslidden. He lived like a pig, but he didn't change into a pig. He was still the man's son. His his standing as the man's son never changed. Uh, so um, that uh, that's just kind of a pet peeve of mine. The way that a lot of people either misapply that story and and label it as a different than the way I uh, the words I would use. But getting back to you, and if you want to say anything about what I just said, go ahead and re respond. But getting back to you, you were backslidden. You lost interest in church, uh, and just, just just stopped going and lost interest. But but if the subject of God came up, you didn't like just you know uh, you know uh, pretend that you you were not a Christian. You would speak up and identify yourself, and then get not humiliated, but yeah choose to being a fool right yeah that, that that that's basically what it is it was my foundation was always there and and i and i can thank my mom for that i guess and uh yeah so all i needed was some some good old mocking i guess and that, that brings me to today where i uh, i i enjoy uh sharing my faith i enjoy um witnessing and it's become quite, um, I won't say easy, but yeah, I guess it is. It's pretty easy for me today. So, yeah. uh, so uh, where did you uh, uh, participate in that Kent Hovind program? That was at a, that was at a church uh, that my wife was going to at the time. So, um, they yeah. it was a big, it was a big, uh, what do you call it, non-denominational uh, prosperity gospel church. Right. <laughs> So that was pretty recently then, because you, your wife, and that, that only goes back to eleven years in your marriage. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I don't want to go too far, but but before, if you want to fill in a little bit of that gap, uh, yeah, still. during that during that time, uh, I and most uh, a lot of people in the chat room they they know they've heard me talk about this before, but I I was a big I was into music, I was into eighties heavy metal, okay, eighties eighties metal uh, metal bands like Kiss was my number one, all right. Now, <laughs> to the point where, okay, I remember I was three, uh, I was in grade three, however old you are in grade three, I remember going to a friend's place and his brother's room was covered in kiss pictures from, you couldn't see the walls, everything was, everything was kiss picture, and I was just, whoa, I was just enthralled by the look, right, I, I didn't even know anything about the music initially until later on, but, but the look just, I was like, wow, this is amazing, so I, uh, to the point where I, I dressed up in Halloween as Ace Frehley, one of the members, the guitarist, and I remember wearing my mom's wig, and uh, and I, I had a picture of it, and and I kept that picture for a long time, and then I got right in, I got right into it eventually, where you know I'm an artist, so I do, I did the makeup really well, so I was able to, it was bang on, and I made my own boots, the big big heeled boots, the whole thing, right. And the blood, and uh, so I was the Gene. Sim I was I was Gene Simmons when I got a little older, and I, I used that same wig. It was interesting, the same wig that I wore as a kid that on Halloween. I used that same wig when I was going out uh, older, going to the bars and doing the, the costume contests and going to going to the Kiss concerts and all that. And and to be honest, it was fun. <laughs> I had a whole lot of fun doing that, but 
now I can look back at it and I go, oh boy, <laughs> what the heck was I doing? I, was, I, I shake my head now and I, I got to kind of laugh at it. But uh, even even through that, you know, I guess God's he was still with me the whole time. He was being long suffering with me and uh, wasting time, wasting money, a lot of money because Kiss is very well known for their 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 uh, merchandise. Right. So you waste a lot of money buying this stuff now. I don't I don't know. I don't think Bryce is in the in the chat room, but he's shared with us his love of Kiss, too. And it's interesting because he's very young. And uh, so, yeah, that, I, I did a lot of that. I, wa I wanted to be a rock star like most young boys did, at, at least at that time. And uh, I, I was never good at music. I played trumpet in school, and I wasn't even good at that. I was third trumpet, so uh, I read the music then. But uh, I, I wanted to play guitar, so I got a bass guitar. And the one and only time I ever got to play on stage was a friend of mine had a band, and we ended up playing at a Halloween show in, at a bar outside the city. And I got up there and spit blood and did all these gory things that goes along with Kiss, right? And and I had a blast doing it. And now I had a knee-jerk reaction to it after, and and I, I I deleted a lot of my photos. I and and I scrapped all my merchandise, all the CDs and everything. I did all that, and it was cathartic. I did need to do that. But now, now I've, I've swung from one ditch to the other and back, and now I'm just resting in Christ, and I can hear the music and not freak out about it and not be religious yeah. about it. So, Well, uh, a person can. I think it's okay for a person, uh, a, a believer, to want to, let's say, get in theater and put on costumes and act and and or go to a party and it's a costume party and have some fun and i don't i would not find any fault in that at all but the way what you're describing is something uh, more than that and it also uh, is a period either during a backslidden state or before you actually understood the gospel and, and really uh, the clarity of it and got uh, the holy spirit to to, to give you the uh uh, prompt you with the right I would say it seemed like your desires and your discernment was off at that time am I how would you, how, how, how do you react to my uh, thoughts on that what yeah well the music uh, is very powerful Satan most definitely uses it to his advantage and uh, especially that type of well I guess heavy metal is known for that but uh, uh yeah i got sucked in and it's just the lust of the flesh <laughs> that's, that's really all it is so my discernment obviously was not there uh, i didn't have enough foundation because i can look back now and i and i can see how my sister grew up in the church and whatnot and now yes i do i didn't I don't think i told you i do have a son and he's uh, nine years old and uh, so i look back at my time in the church and i and i go okay I obviously didn't have enough. I didn't get enough. I didn't get the fullness of the gospel, and I didn't get it, it explained to me, you know, the proper rules of okay, not the Ten Commandments per se, but you know, you know, certain things you don't do. Like my sister, she wanted at the time to move out with her boyfriend when she was whatever, 20 years old or 18 years old or something like that, and she was living in with, with my with my mom and dad still, and and and. Uh, she she didn't want me to tell them that she was going to move out with him, and I'm like, well, why not? What's what's wrong with that? And I remember thinking back, like, okay, every, everyone seems to do it. What I don't I don't get it. I, but like, what, why don't you want to tell her? So I see that now, and I go, okay, I want to make sure that my son understands all of these things, what God expects of us. But obviously, the fullness of the gospel that no matter what you do, you can't lose your salvation. So yeah. Okay, um, so we, you go, you're in this backslidden period, and uh, what was it that snapped you out of that, that, that made you uh, renewed your interest or, or created a new interest in, in Jesus and, and the Bible? Okay, before before we get there, I just wanna I'm gonna be totally honest with the, with everybody here that I, I did have 
like my life wasn't all roses and, and, and rainbows and unicorns. Uh, I did I did do the drinking and it could have become an issue, but it didn't per se. Uh, but uh, one thing that was an issue for me was, and I hate this, I hate to admit this, but I'm going to be honest because I want I want other men to be honest with themselves and be honest with their families and their wives and whoever it is, the people in their church. If they need help, they need to be honest about it that I had a problem with pornography. Okay? I don't even like talking about it, but it's it's shameful to me and now and, and but it's part of, well, it's part of everyday life in this world. And the devil uses that very powerfully. So it starts off very innocent enough when you're super young, when you're really young. And it's even uh, it's got to be even that much worse today because kids have access to it on the internet just so easily. When, it, when, I, when I was young, I didn't have the access to it. There's only, you know, little things here and there, magazines and whatnot that you couldn't, you could, couldn't get. They were behind the counter and stuff. So boys would sneak them from their dads and stuff. And... So yeah, that that starts and it's so powerful and you get so sucked into it and it really does rewire your brain and mess you up. So having said that, don't want to talk about that a whole lot, but you can comment on it if you want. And uh, then going into how I got drawn back into into God, then we can talk about that. Mm -hmm. Well, the, um, the, the interest in pornography is probably uh, universal for all boys a as we go through our change or puberty and we start getting uh, these hormonal changes and thoughts come into our mind and we start realizing that there are pictures uh, in my days as a young boy it, it wasn't really pornography except for the the, the, the magazines but as far as the videos and what is available today on the internet, uh, it was just the magazines. But I, I do think that it's almost a, uh, unfortunately, because in America, it may be true all over the world, I don't know. But in America, it just seems like it's almost inescapable that at some point a young boy is going to be exposed to it and it's going to fascinate them. And now the question is, how deeply do they go into it or not? We all, we probably all go into it to a certain extent. Now, in your case, you're you're saying that uh, I, if I'm understanding you right, that you went into it quite a bit. It became really a big issue, and so uh, so you can speak. Uh, I mean, I could I could confess all kinds of shameful things if I wasn't too ashamed to say it. I, I I'm just too ashamed to even tell you the things that uh, my my issues as a, a younger man. Uh, but uh, you, if you feel that this is something that you can help other people with by telling them what what was was this just prior to you, uh, uh, let's say coming back to the Lord or realizing that the Lord is is really the the, the priority in your life. Uh, yeah, that was I guess the peak of it. I guess you could say. You know, it, it builds up over the years, starts small and just kind of builds and builds. And then it just starts to take over time in your life. You know, you should be doing other things and it's it, it really is destructive. So, yeah, it built up to that. And then just just prior to uh, going start going back to church, then that's when things change. Uh, is this, uh, is this uh, just prior to getting together with your wife and then getting married? And I'm, maybe I'm uh, putting more together. Yeah, yeah, that that's bas that's basically it. We we got, we had gotten together, and she 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 had been in going to this church for like at that time probably 15 years to that same church, and she was the interpreter for the deaf at that church. So um, she would always yeah. So we yeah we weren't married yet, and she was uh, she was going there, and she would ask me if I wanted to go, and I'd be like nah. No, you go. That's fine. No problem. Every once in a while, over the years, over that backslidden time, I would go back to my, my mom's, mom and dad's Baptist church. You know, we'd go for this event or that event. And it was always felt good to me to go back there. It, and I would talk to the pastor. Oh, hey, how you doing? This and that. And, you know, in and out. And there was always love. They always loved me. And they never, no one ever shunned me and, said, and gave me any kind of grief or anything. And so that always felt really good. 
And then, uh, yeah, so my wife and I met, and then she she was going to this church, and finally, eventually, I got sucked into <laughs> going going there. So we we attended her church uh, for I I think I was there for about eight years before there was another switch. We left that church. So yeah, we can get into that. Yeah, I'd like to know your experience with that first church with you, you and your wife and, and uh, what they taught you and, and why you left and also what your wife's uh, uh, doctrinal positions were uh, during that period of time, if if you don't mind. Well, she was at, okay, this, this church was non-denominational. It's a big church, three services, probably 3,000 people. Um, I didn't know anything, you know, just coming back into the into the church scene, I had no idea what was going on, right? So I was very vulnerable to get sucked into bad doctrine and whatnot and not even know it. So so for like almost eight years, uh, everything was fine. So I'm going to this church, but always, something always felt wrong. Something, I could, I could never get connected with anyone. Um, God was just bringing, using this to bring me back in. And, and my wife, we were, what, what exactly she believed back then? I don't know. She believed in, in God and she believed in well, Jesus and the whole thing. But, you know, she was so pretty back, somewhat backslidden, I guess. She was still going to church, but she, but I wasn't. But, uh, but you know, we were, we were having sex outside of marriage and, you know, so all that stuff. So, uh, you know, that we're in that position. But uh, the church itself... It was pros basically prosperity decisionism, if I could put it in a nutshell. Now, now, now that I know what all these things mean, <laughs> so they. And it was interesting because I thought everything was fine. I tried to get plugged into the church, and I started going to their small groups, uh, which which were which were okay, but uh, they didn't have great teachers now that I look back they didn't have great teachers and whatnot and then they were just DVD series anyway there was there was nobody there actually reading from the word doing a Bible study going through verse by verse it was always a, a DVD from some from Joyce Myers or something like that right so yeah. so and I can never get I can never get hooked up with anybody and it was the weird part I found that nobody wanted as I started to 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 come back to Christ and I wanted doctrine I was I was starting to get thirsty right so I wanted doctrine and I'm like Okay, I wanted to get plugged in, and I wanted to talk about Jesus, but it was nobody wanted nobody wanted to talk about Jesus. Like in inside the the service, you're listening to the pastor, you're yeah. listening, you're looking at the smoke bombs, and the, and you're looking at and the mirrors and the smoke and all the stuff going on, and, and everyone's waving their hands. Okay, that's all fine and great, but then outside of that, in the hallway, everyone's talking about their vacation and hockey and this and that, and nobody wanted to talk about Jesus. So I'm like, I was confused. Yeah. Wow, I've I've seen that it's it's a pandemic problem in the church that uh, th while they're there they'll listen to a message about Jesus or you know if the pastor even bothers to talk about Jesus but they'll that's okay within those walls but as soon as they walk out there's no hey you want to talk about you know we, we did that already we did that you know it's <laughs> But uh, to me, this is the uh, kind of a, I don't I hate to say litmus test, but a, a kind of an odometer of, uh, of uh, as, I, as I look at people in their faith is, <laughs> do they want to talk about and think about Jesus every day? Or is he just said, said you know, got this little slot in time once a week? But you're, you go through this where you're starting to get an interest. Well, I want to talk about Jesus outside of the church building. And maybe you have an interest in him, not just on Sundays, too. So uh, then, then where did you go and what did you do so that you could start getting um, to find the right people who who could fellowship with you and, and learn the right, uh, learn the doctrines as you understand them now? Well, I started to. Uh... I just got really interested in prophecy. I got really interested after 9-11, uh, like quite a ways after 9-11, like maybe 2008 when the, when the collapse happened in the economy. I, I really started to get an interest in, <clears throat> in Bible prophecy and what's coming, revelation, eschatology, and, and I really started to dig into that. And 
it, it's uh, it's kind of started off with listening to Alex Jones and, and I don't know if you know who he is, but uh, um, getting information from these other people that that I've since dropped, and uh, so I, I I really wanted I was asking God for for to bring me bring me to somebody that I can share with, right? So can okay, bring me to a group that I can talk about these end time stuff and all this. I was very interested in all that. And, but the interesting thing is he, he never did. I waited eight years probably before he gave me somebody to talk to. And it became apparent that, well, okay, I'm not focusing on the right thing. Okay, it's okay to, it's okay to search these things out and whatnot, but that was my main focus. I wasn't focused on the gospel, right? And I didn't realize that, okay, I guess I had the, the thought that, okay, I'm saved and okay, that's great. What do we need to talk about the gospel for? <laughs> Let's talk about the Bible. Let's talk about all the other stuff that's in there. Not, not until I met you guys <clears throat> did God open up the door for me and actually give me all this, the chat room, you guys, everybody to, to, to share with. So I found that pretty interesting. Hmm. Well, uh, it, it's a, a lot of the experiences that you, you have, and periods that you've gone through are, um, it's, it's kind of a, a very common pattern that I, I see in, in all of us. And, and there, I think that probably everybody we know in the church now goes through a period where uh, end times becomes a, a subject of great interest and sometimes obsessive subject where uh, it, it elevated to the we're focused entirely on that and, and uh, it can really distract us from what, what really is the, the, the most important things uh, so you, but uh, it did kind of in a way serve a purpose of uh, getting you interested in it probably in the Bible uh, because of at least the aspect in the Bible about end times but then you recognize that this there's something more important than end times and uh, what what clicked? Uh, did you just stumble across talking doctrine or Renee or and, and uh, did you stumble across them at some point and uh, uh, or or were you seeking to say, hey, I need to get away from eschatology and and conspiracy theories and all uh, you know the Illuminati and the Masons and all that that's so interesting. There's something else that uh, God wants me to know that's much more important. And did, did it dawn on you or did you stumble across? Well, it it, uh, it started with me starting starting to read my own Bible, <laughs> read the Bible for myself, right? Because uh, I was getting to the point where I was getting uh, getting frustrated with the pastor that that the church we were going to, and and because I started reading my Bible, and what I was reading there wasn't matching what that guy was saying. <laughs> so, so the Holy Spirit really started to work on me like heavy duty. I got a I got a what I call a Holy Spirit uh, two by four to the back of the head, and I'm like, oh my. And there's a reason why God didn't let me get connected in that church because he didn't want me there because uh, I even tried to use my talents. I tried to use my graphic talents because uh, they make they make all these beautiful pamphlets and stuff for every week to, to lay on the chairs and stuff. So I wanted to get hooked up that way. And what was interesting is they, 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 they shut me down flat. Like I, I, I gave them samples and everything and, and, and I could do the work and, and they never gave me the work. So obviously God had, a, had another reason. There, there was a reason for that. So I started reading my own, my own Bible and figured out that what they were preaching wasn't right. So I ended up, uh, I, I, I started going online, right? I, I'm, I'm searching all this, like you said, Illuminati, this stuff, this, that, and the other. And that's where I ran across D13, D13 Watchmen, right? So Matthias was on there at the time and he, they were doing their thing and they had what, 5,000 people watching on a night, but they were talking, you know, the fun stuff that I liked, the, the, the Nephilim and, and uh, whatever, UFOs and all the crazy stuff, right? So I, I enjoyed that. And then, but then all of a sudden Kip went, Kip, the, the guy that was running the show, running the show there, he, he went dark and they weren't doing anything for a while. And uh, this was what, I don't know, two years ago, maybe more now, maybe three now, I, I can't even keep track. But uh, Matthias, I, I guess, I don't even know how I got his email. Somehow I got his email and I, and I sent him an email. And I said, hey, where are you guys at? What's going on? I'll come, what's going on? He's like, oh, I'm over here. We, we, I started up 
this other one over here is the talking doctor. I'm like, okay, so that's boom. There, there it was. <clears throat> so I had never been online before in, in any chat room. I had never been a part of any community like this. Uh, uh, I always looked from afar and thought it was kind of crazy. <laughs> Uh, and it, I guess in a lot of ways, on a lot of channels, it is crazy. People get in there and they just fight and they do whatever they're doing, right? But God was opening up the door for me to have this family, finally, after eight years of, of frustration and not finding any, anything. But then he, it was him, it was Matthias, and you, he, God used him and his talking doctor and that, okay, this is where I want to be. So, so, but listening to, listening to them talk about the gospel, and giving the fullness of it, like like I had I had all the pieces, I just didn't realize I needed to connect them all and focus strictly on the gospel itself, and and that was huge for me. So uh, yeah, that's that's how I found him anyway. Okay, let me. Uh, I I don't want to neglect uh, your wife and son here in this talk here, but your uh, so as you. Uh, we're going to church with your wife, and then you left the church. And did you? Did your wife have any of these same thoughts, uh, or what was her attitude about all this as you're going through this uh, transition? Yeah, you know what? That was one of the hardest things I ever had to do in my life is to figure out a way to get out of the church. Right. Uh, my wife. She didn't really, she didn't see what I saw. She didn't understand what I was going through. And, uh, and so she, she would get upset that I wasn't happy. Uh, she, she was visibly noticeable on, on Sunday mornings and, and because I was reading the, reading the Bible and every, every time he would say something wrong, I would be sitting there shaking my head. She's like, what's your, what's your problem? You know, and I'm like, I'm like, well, okay, this isn't right. This isn't right. This isn't right. And she, and she was getting angry at me. So, and that's, that's understandable. Uh, she wasn't necessarily reading her Bible either. Right. So, uh, the Holy Spirit, it was, took a, it was about a two year process that I had to go through of grieving and some really harsh, um, what do you call it? Anxiety. Towards the end, there was some pretty good anxiety I had going because I didn't know how it was how this was going to happen. I wasn't trusting God. I found out. I realized later I wasn't trusting God to do it for me, but He was gracious enough to do it for me because in the end, it, it got it got to the point where I sat down for about five hours and I put together a letter for my wife and I explained every little thing that I needed to say why we should leave the church. Okay, and I was freaking out about it. I had so much anxiety, and we just, and finally it got to the point where, okay, we're going for dinner. We're going to talk about this. So we got, we got to the restaurant, and I had, I had the, the thing in my pocket, this, this five-page letter and everything, and I was ready to lay it all out for her, and then she just looked at me before we even said anything. She looked me right in the eye, and she goes, I think it's time for us to leave. <laughs> oh, wow. And I, I started to cry. <clears throat> and I'm like, whoa, are you serious? Yeah. Okay. So that was huge. God, God, that was, a, that was an answer to prayer. <laughs> wow. But she, you know, she didn't necessarily understand it all, but she said she understood and she said, okay, let's, you know, she understood to a point. She goes, yeah, this is very shallow here. You know, and then she didn't see the, 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 the doctrinal errors of it, but she did realize how shallow it was and this and that, and that we should go. And we ended up going back to my old uh, Baptist church that I grew up in, and we're still there to this day, and it's, we're very happy. It's, okay. Uh, That's, yeah. That would going to be my next question, if you have a local church uh, that you found that is uh, good for you. <clears throat> Did you ever have to give her the letter, or was it not necessary? Nope. She never read it. <laughs> interesting. Yeah. Um, so you're back at that church together. Has she developed interest in, um, you know, uh, really studying uh, along with your interest or, or not? Well, no, I screwed that up. <laughs> I screwed that up. We haven't talked about this yet, but uh, I ended up getting sick back in 2012. Mm. And I went through a very dark time, not knowing exactly what was going on. And through that whole time that I was studying, uh, 
uh, revelation and end time stuff, <clears throat> I was actually to the point where I was freaking out. I had swung into the ditch where this is it. We're in the end times. Obama's the Antichrist, and that's it. We're done. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I turned into a bit of a prepper, and she she just didn't get it. She just didn't understand what was going on. And she was freaking her out, and I was and I was I was being overbearing, very way overbearing. But what I found out was what I know now, only within the last six months, is that I had <laughs> mercury brain. I guess you could say, if you want me to go into that or at all. But uh, yeah, I, matter of fact, I just wrote down as you're talking there uh, the healing. You mentioned earlier that there was a miraculous healing, and we've talked a little bit about the mercury question. So, uh, yeah, tell us whatever you you would like to share with us on, on that experience. Well, the, the the healing itself had nothing to do with the the, the mercury poisoning, but uh, I had I had bad knees. I'm trying to remember the year, 2011 or something like that, for for a few years before I even met my wife. I was I had really bad knees, sharp pain under my kneecaps, and uh, and okay, it's they gave a name for it. I can't even remember what it was. I was going to physiotherapy, and it really wasn't doing anything, and I wasn't holding out a whole lot of hope. And then I, I met my wife, and uh, we ended up looking for a home. And as we're looking for a, a house, uh, I almost didn't buy the house that we're I'm sitting in right now because there was a second floor to the point where my knees were so we were in so much pain I couldn't I could barely walk upstairs. Mm -hmm. So. I, I could walk normal, but when it came to having to bend them, it was really bad. And they would wake me up in the middle of the night in pain, and and it, it was pretty, it was pretty bad. And now that I think about it, it's been a while since I thought about it. But at the time, I was seeking God, and I was I was like, okay, I see these these uh, these charlatans, these seeming charlatans on TV, and they're they're putting hands on people, be healed, and people are falling back, and all this craziness is going on. And I'm like, okay, Lord, is this? real are you healing today through this stuff like what's going on here i was just seeking i was just looking for answers and uh i was i was following a bunch i was watching a sid roth you know i'm sure you're familiar with him sid roth show mm -hmm. uh, i i think now when i look back he probably has the false gospel but whatever he god's you god was using all of these people that i was following at the time to, to bring me to him but uh he had a he had a, a guy on i think it was todd white who has unfortunately gone completely off the rails into the ditch today. But uh, he, he was a street preacher. He would go out and he would lay hands on people out there, and they seemed to be healed. Whether they were or not, I don't have a clue. But my faith was being built just listening and watching these shows, right? So one day at work, uh, I'm sitting there at break time. I got my iPod. I had downloaded uh, one of Sid Roth's shows. And at the end, they would uh, he would say, okay, anyone, anyone – Watching right now, just look into the camera and whatever pain you got, if you got a sore neck, put your hand on there, whatever, whatever it is, and I'm just going to pray for you. So I'm like, okay, well, why not? Why not? Let's give it a shot. So I'm sitting there, and to get out of my car or to get out of a chair, I would have to really push with my hands because I, I couldn't be in the bent position and put any pressure on my knees. Otherwise, I would get that sharp pain. So... Uh, so he, he starts praying, and my, it took me a second to even realize it because I've been watching the show for a while. I'm like, do I have anything there? Oh, well, hang on. Wait a minute. Of course, my knees. So I put my hands on my knees, and then he prays, and then he said, okay, test your faith. He said, whatever whatever hurts, just try and do what you would do to, to cause that pain. And I'm like, okay, here we go. Let's do this. So I put my hands above the table where I would normally put my hands down on the chair and push as hard as I could to, to get up without pain. I said, okay, so I pushed my chair back and then I put my hands above the table and I just stood up. Mm. <laughs> Straight up. And, I, and I'm like, wait a minute, that didn't hurt. Uh, this couldn't be happening, could it? So I sat back down and I did it again. I'm like, oh, wow. Uh, so so I that feeling of, <laughs> okay, did this just really happen? Did I just get healed are you kidding me and then I, I was just humming I was just humming with energy and and I was like I was I was floating probably <laughs> I felt like I was floating above the ground and I'm like whoa so I spent the whole the rest of the day just just going okay did this really happen and then by the end of the day I got home and, and, and I remember looking at my knees and they were actually kind of red they were rosy red uh, they were kind of burning which I've heard from people that, that do get instant healings that, that it's kind of, it gets kind of hot in that area. So 
Here you go. Wow. Well, praise Jesus. That is so wonderful. And, uh, you know, the subject comes up quite often. We, you know, we, we pray for each other all the time. And I always ask the Lord, Lord, don't just answer the prayer and, and don't just heal, but do it in a spectacular way so that it's unmistakable. It's you that did it. It can't be, it can't be credited any other place but you. That's how I ask for these prayers to be answered. And when we get examples like this, you know, it just it's just a wonderful thing to know that we we can ask and we do get answers. Uh, now I happen to think that there, the idea of uh, the gift of healing and the, all the gifts and spiritual gifts and stuff uh, uh, that uh, there's not individuals that are designated as the gift of healing. But I do believe that healing is not past. God still heals, but he doesn't designate an individual as having the gift of healing. I, I think that that was, that was done uh, in the very beginning of the church so that they could do signs and wonders and get the church jump started because by doing these miraculous things they got everybody's attention that's why jesus did his miracles too it's not just because he was a, a nice guy it's, and wanted to heal people he did it to prove uh, who he is and uh so uh, yeah miracles happen i've got um, a count of numerous miracles that i've uh, witnessed and, and been involved in so i'm happy to hear about your kid your example here too uh you're muted okay were you did you meet for on purpose or was it an accident yeah i just uh, my wife and my son are kind of i don't know if you can hear them or not they're in the other room oh, okay all right then um all right we're getting uh i guess uh near the end of the conversation now and uh um i think we've covered all the periods of your life oh you tell me more about your son he's nine years old Yes, and he is an absolute blessing. He is a wonderful kid. Uh, couldn't ask for more. Uh -huh. and, uh, and does he have interest in uh, Jesus and uh, Bible? Uh, I'm sure you've talked to him about it, but how much interest does he have at this age? Yes, actually he does. Um, we take him, he goes to a, a, private, a private school, a Christian school. Mm -hmm. So that that is that's actually a, a real blessing. But see, what's interesting is that it's <laughs> it's in the same church that we left. <laughs> that's the that's the interesting part. So the, the school is run separate from the church, but it is in it is, it is in the same building. Now, oh, here we go. And here here he comes in right now. Just give me one quick second. All right, sure. I'm on live right now. Want to say hi, to Luke? Hello. Hey, your father is very proud of you. Thank you. <laughs> very, very much. We're just talking about you right now, actually. Really? We are. And uh, yeah, so you're on your way to bed? Yeah. Okay, good night. Good night. Fantastic. I love you. Sweet dreams. God bless. Have a good night. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, that was a great pleasure. Um, that was good timing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was a God incidence. Yeah, there you go, a God incidence. Yeah. So, yeah, so yeah, he goes to that school, and uh, we're we're blessed with really good teachers. They're they're they put Jesus and and the Bible into all the all the courses, all the classes, and uh, he learns uh, Bible verses, and he's won awards for memorizing Bible verses, and he's got the Saint Saint Paul Award at the end of the year and stuff like that. So yeah, it's it's going really well. Yeah. And uh, what I'm most proud about him right now is he's, I, I got him, we're reading, we're reading through the Bible. Like he, uh, where, where I have to take him, he's quite, quite far away. Uh, it's about a half an hour drive for me to go pick him up at the end of the day. So I go pick him up and on the, on the way home, we have some time together. So we talk and what, we talk about our day, but then we, we read the Bible. And now I've got him, I've got him to the point where we're reading the King James. And he's actually doing really well, actually reading through the these and nows. At first he was bucking it, but now he's actually doing he's actually doing really well. And if he's if he doesn't understand something, I just explain it and and so I think that's a really good way to learn. Just just read it and talk about it. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, all right. Uh, I guess the 
Well, I wanted to go back, if you don't mind, um, I want to ask you about your father some more. Uh, uh, I, I'm sure that you made attempts to have the conversations with him, and, but what, it, what do you think is the stumbling block with your father? Oh, good question. Uh, he, he, he grew up without a father. His, his dad died in the war, came over from like, uh, Germany, uh, moved over here. And, uh, so he grew up with just, uh, just his mom and his mom, his mom, my grandma, she, she tried to raise him properly and working on the farm, that whole thing. And so there was always that foundation for him there. And, and it's not, it wasn't foreign to him at all. And then especially with being with my mom and she, she was always going to church. So he was always tagging along with my mom. He, and, and to this day, he still comes to church and he's a, he's a, he's an usher and whatnot. And I'm sure most people in the church probably think he's saved, but uh, I keep telling everybody in the church, he's not saved. Pray for him. <laughs> and, uh, and I've asked him, I've asked him straight up, you know what? I, 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 we've had heart to hearts. I've had, I've sat down with him and, and said, okay, dad, what's going on here? Why, why can't you, what is, and he's like, I honestly don't know. So he's got this spiritual blindness that even he doesn't really understand. And yet I do as much as I can. So I don't want to preach to him. So I preach uh, at the same time, like when I go visit my parents, they're, you know, they're older and they're, they're not in great health. So, but my mom, so I, I talked to my mom. I said, mom, did, did, did you know about this? Did you know about that? Here's some crazy stuff going on in the world. Here's some eschatology going on here. And, and then I would, you know, I, and then it, I, I've been blessed to have a lot of people at work that I've been able to share my faith with. God's opened up a huge door, and we can talk about that, but uh, a lot of people have come through my area, new people uh, that I've been able to share the gospel with. So I tell those stories of sharing the gospel with these people. Yeah, here's what I told this guy, you know, you, you, you got you to you just, just believe, you know, you got to get in the Word and you gotta, whatever. So I would, I would be talking to my mom knowing that my dad's listening. <laughs> so that was kind of a good way, I think, to not preach at him where he's going to be offended necessarily. But uh, so, yeah, uh, and my dad, I, I just I just don't really know. I do. I think I'm at a point now where I do need to have another sit down with him just one on one. Well, does he um, uh, read the Bible at all? No. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, and he must be, uh, you're 48, so he must be 68 or more. Uh, he's 70, he's 77. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. <clears throat> well, uh, you know, I know that as we get older, uh, we it's, it's not like we're ignorant that time's running out. We're very much aware that <laughs> time is running out pretty soon. And many times that is uh, the thing that motivates someone to... Uh, get right with God. They don't know what they've got to do, but they want to do it. And, and uh, oh, at the church, though, where he's an usher, has he ever heard the real, of course, you've told him the real gospel, but he, he does he just outright just reject it? And, uh, or say no. he can't do it or what? He just can't seem to, he just can't seem to grasp, I guess. Uh, I see. I don't know. He doesn't seem to know. Uh, I don't know if he thinks that just by going to church, uh, you know, who knows what's going on. Because he's a very, he's, he's a great, he's a great guy that just does it. And I, and I would hate to have him not get saved because he spent his whole life serving everybody else. He's been that type of guy. He's shown, he's shown me patience. He's shown me how to, how to be a man and how to do, how to, how to, how to treat others. And, and it's been, it's been wonderful. And, and. It breaks my heart that, that he's not saved yet. So, but I, I'm just praying that it's not a deathbed confession that uh, that is required here. Yeah. Well, you know, we um, probably almost all of us experience the uh, the uh, situation Jesus talked about, uh, where a prophet is not recognized in his own town, and of course we realize that well, our own family, our own friends, the people who've known us the longest are not going to listen to us because they they don't look at us as any kind of spiritual or theologian type authority so why should they listen to us um, so sometimes they have to hear it from somebody else uh, do, do you think he'd be willing to like um, I, I, i'd love for him to listen to the the gospel message i have on my channel it's 
15 minutes long. Do you, do you think it, he'd be willing to listen to a video for 15 minutes? Well, uh, uh, that, that's a tough one. You know what? I, I've heard him regurgitate some things that I have said. Like, I, I know he's listening because he has brought these things up again in passing and in conversation and stuff. So I know he, it is the seeds are being planted and God, I pray, is watering them. And, but, uh, but I'm going to have to get, by God's leading, I'm going to have to get serious and, and just start hammering away at this and going, okay. Because he, he spends so much time looking after my mom. She's she's not doing all that well. So he spends all his time looking after her, and he's just so busy. And Do you, Does he uh, use email, or is he too ancient for that? Yeah, yeah, no, no email. No, no, they don't even have a computer. Yeah. Um, well, maybe uh, you know, someone else, I can't remember who it was in our congregation here, uh, was asking for some help, some Bible verses. Uh, to give to her father or some loved one uh, about faith alone and eternal security. And uh, so I sent her some verses, and then she wanted more, and so I sent her more. But I said, look, you can overwhelm someone by giving them, you know, 20 or 30 verses. and not, alone, not they, they basically won't even take the time because they look at it and they say, oh, that's, that's too much. But if you give them one verse, and then maybe next week you send them one verse, and the following week, you send them one verse. Um, it's not, they're, they're probably not going to feel overwhelmed or offended that you're trying to cram something down their throat by giving them all this stuff all at once. But one verse, once a week, they might be willing to actually read it. So if you pick out a few of the most important verses to tell the that, hey, it's, it's not by works of righteousness, which we've done. You know, so th those verses, you know what they are. And just give them a verse uh, somehow. If it's not email, you can't do that. you got to find some way to get them a verse. And just do it. And if you just persist uh, one verse every week, uh, I think he might also appreciate it uh, just because he, he sees that the, the, the love and concern that you have for him and the, and the determination that you're, you're going to patiently, lovingly give him a verse every week. That's what <laughs> I think. I, I would hope you try that. Yeah, actually, I don't. Uh, I do like that, uh, that that idea. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, okay. I guess. Uh, is there anything trying to cover your whole life here tonight? <laughs> is there anything that we you think that uh, we missed uh, that is uh, that you'd like to, to to cover before we're finished? Yeah, actually, I just want to. As much as I don't like talking about it, I do want to talk about. Uh, the porn thing that uh, how God delivered me from that it was just getting just getting back into his words like uh, anyone who's struggling with any kind of sin it's not about your sin right but you do you don't want to have to deal with it you want Jesus to deal with it for you so it all, all this stuff like Matthew 6:33 is one of my favorites seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you so um, I always kind of hung on to that one, and uh, and as I started just getting into the Bible, reading reading through the Bible, uh, the first the first two first two years I went through the Bible, it was with a um, still on still online today. You can get it. It's called Daily Audio Bible, and this this one guy reads through every day, uh, Old Testament, New Testament, Psalms, and Proverbs a little bit every day, and throughout the whole year, and then you get through the Bible. And I really, I really liked that actually. So I, I was listening to him. It wasn't King James. It was all the other versions. He would use a bunch of different versions, but it was getting me into the Word. And uh, so I did that for the first two years through the Bible, and then I started. Then I started reading it on my own. But uh, as as I was reading through, God was just dealing with me. The more I focused on Him, the uh, this other stuff just faded away. Like I didn't have to to focus on not looking at porn. It just went away. God, God was gracious to me through the whole thing, and it, He took away that desire, and it was just a focusing on Him, and, and that went away, and you know, the, the whatever issues I had, they were just gone. So call that deliverance if you want. <laughs> there was no demon deliverance involved. It was just a He was poured out His grace on me, and it and it just faded away. So praise God for that. So just I wanted to share that. Yeah. All right. Thank you. 
Um, well, I like to ask what what a person's like objectives are from, from the day forward in terms of your ministry, because I mean, I keep on saying this. Uh, I I don't I'm don't know why I have to teach this to everybody. <laughs> Sorry, but when you put your faith in Jesus and you're you're born again, you're a child of God. Now God, Jesus has a job for you. It's uh, you know it's a ministry. Someone asked me if I was a pastor once when, uh, years ago, and I said, no, I'm a minister. They said, well, isn't that the same thing? And they said, no, no, every Christian is supposed to be a minister. That means a servant. So we're supposed to get to busy working for, for Jesus. And, and uh, each of us, our jobs are not exactly the same, but we need to ask the Lord to reveal to us, what's the job you have for me? And uh, then once we understand what it is, let's get busy doing it. And if you understand it correctly and you're busy doing it, it'll bring great joy to your life. It will be a labor of love. So I guess I'll just end by asking you, how do you see your ministry? And, and uh, do you have any objectives and things that you'd like to do with it this next in the near future? Well, uh, I'll preface that with, uh, I forgot about this. I, I, got, I got into Ray Comfort at one time and uh, Living Waters Ministry. And uh, I thought that was the right gospel that he had. And I really enjoyed watching him go out on the streets and challenge people and stuff. I had the kind of the same, the same uh, personality, you know, I'd, I'd love to challenge people and stuff. So, so I was using his method and it was actually quite, quite, I'll call it successful, if you will, just at least to get the gospel out. But what I didn't realize, and I had never heard of Lordship Salvation before, and I was and I was confused because I was kept seeing these other videos on YouTube calling him a heretic and it's Lordship Salvation and I couldn't figure out well, what are you talking about? <laughs> Is this not the gospel? Like I don't I don't get it. And and looking back now, I can see that uh, like everything Ray says is great right up until the very end <laughs> when yeah. he says you gotta you gotta forsake your sins, mm -hmm. you gotta stop sinning. So I didn't see that right. And it's interesting because even though I used his process. His, his way, so to speak, uh, and, and it worked. And, it, and it, the law does its job. It does what it's supposed to do. You know, you, you ask people these questions and they're more than willing to, usually more than willing to tell you, yeah, I'm a sinner, yeah, I'm this, yeah, I'm that. I'm going to heaven still. I'm a good person. So, so that whole process was really good. But um, I never once told somebody that they had to repent of their sins. And, and I didn't, even though I didn't understand at the time that that was considered lordship salvation. But... So I finally, by going through talking doctrine and you guys and whatnot, that's when the fullness of it came to me, and I'm like, okay, now now I get it. And and I I was always wondering why I could never land the plane, as they say, you know, when you're trying to you're trying to get someone saved, you you want them. I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted them to do. Pray a prayer? Well, not necessarily. Uh, it's just why I even asked my pastor. I said, how do you do it? How do you get? How do you land the plane? Sort of thing here. And even he didn't really kind of give me the uh, an answer that I that I really liked until now. For through you guys, uh, through the fullness of, the, of of knowing the gospel, that I don't have to land the plane. That's God's job. <laughs> so uh, and it's not about okay the proper uh, definition definition of repentance and and all of that now. So I've I've pretty much had to drop almost every single person that I've ever followed in the past. <laughs> And I'm okay with that. The, the, the spot I'm in right now, I'm really happy. So, um, and God's opened the doors at work, especially at work. Um, and I've had the opportunity to share the gospel. I can't even, I, not to brag or anything. Uh, he's blessed me with, uh, with multi, a lot of people that I've been able to share with in some way, one way or another, I've been able to give the gospel to, to a lot of different people. So that is kind of my ministry to answer your question. Uh, at, mostly at work. And usually I go in almost every day and I say, okay, Lord, what do you got today? And he, he usually kicks a door wide open for me, right? It's got to that point where, all right, we had a bunch of new people. We've had 15 people new in the last few months and probably over half of those I've been able to give the gospel to already. So, and it's just like, hey, who's this person? Where are they at? And boom, the doors kick wide open and right there we, here we go so i enjoy that a lot that's a lot of fun mm -hmm. and as far as okay well that's at work but then here now on on youtube you guys, you guys just just continue 
uh, to I never planned on this Monday's milk uh, that I'm on every week or every, every time we're on anyway. Uh, but <clears throat> I'm, I'm really enjoying it a lot. So as long as Matthias and I have me, uh, uh, I'm happy to do that. And it was through Mike, uh, that friend of mine, that it was his idea actually, because he, he he was he was getting confused with all the deep talk that we had. And he goes, can we not have a show for, for, for people that are just seeking? And it's like, oh, Matthias was like, oh yeah, that's a good point. Maybe we should, hey, let's do it on Mondays and call it Monday's Milk, sure. Boom. So I'm, I'm happy to be a part of that and just see where it goes from here. I don't know what God has. Although, hey, I did, I did get asked by my pastor uh, this past summer to do a sermon. So that was interesting. I, that door kicked, kicked wide open. And uh, I, 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 I was trying to, to at, over the last couple of years, I was trying to lead a men's group, but I was trying to bring in the stuff prior to the gospel, right? I was trying to bring in all the conspiracy stuff and trying to bring in, okay, this uh, eschatology and rapture and all this different stuff. And, and God made it very clear that that's not where I was supposed to be. Like, I, I don't think I only got one meeting out of that. And then the, the second time I wanted to start it up again, I got really sick the day it was supposed to happen. So I took that as a signal. Okay. <laughs> but now he's opened up the doors. Okay, here, here, the, the pastor's going to, eventually hopefully give me uh, allow me to do a sermon so god willing i'm just gonna wait for him to come to me awesome okay uh i know that i'm speaking for everybody in our congregation uh, who knows you and probably most everybody does know you because you are uh, very actively involved and uh uh, I, I'm sure I'm, I'm right in that uh, you're a blessing to all of us, and you're. Uh, I, we tend to get in the flesh; it's easy for us. We we tend to maybe want to gossip or or get a little negative and stuff. But in all my conversation with you, in all my listening and observing you, uh, everything has been just exemplary and positive and a blessing to the whole congregation. So I'd just like you to know, and as I said, I know I'm speaking for everybody that you are really appreciated. Uh, so thank you for taking some time and I appreciate you also filling in for Brenda since she, uh, I didn't have a lot of notice to, to get a replacement, but uh, uh, hopefully down the road, I'll be able to make it work and interview Brenda Z, but you uh, stepped forward and, and uh, so we had uh, someone to interview tonight. So thank you very much. Uh, well, the last thing I want to say about is, is the chat room. I've, I've looked a little bit back at it. And I've been trying to focus as much as I possibly can just on Brother Daryl. But we do have someone in the chat room, a Catholic traditionalist. Uh, uh, I hope I'm, it looks to me like uh, people pretty much have made you feel welcome. Uh, but at the same time, point out the difference between Roman Catholicism and uh, what we would call biblical Christianity. So uh, as long as uh, you're you're uh, Catholic traditionalist and and the as long as uh, you or other uh, like you, you, you don't necessarily have to agree with us. But as long as the the, the conversations are uh, respectful, uh, then uh, you're you're welcome. And I, I hope that someday you'll you'll come to the understanding that Roman Catholicism is. Uh, um, heretical error and you need to get the kind of Christianity that we get out of the Bible. And that's what we're talking about here tonight and always. So, um, hey, Brother Daryl, I'm going to give you a chance to say any last word you may have, and, and then we'll, we'll finish. Say goodnight to everybody. All right. Uh, well, I appreciate those words uh, of encouragement, uh, Luke. Uh, I do appreciate you. You've, uh, you're like the rock of this, uh, this whole thing, keeping everything together and being solid in your faith. And I appreciate that. I've learned a lot from you and as well as everyone else in their own different way. So I enjoy all the different shows or broadcasts as Matthias likes to say. Um, yeah, and I'm going to be sticking around and hanging out in the chat room and, uh, thanks everybody for showing up. Uh, maybe you can get Brenda on next Friday 
Uh, it would be nice to hear from her. She's great. Mm -hmm. but thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Uh, next Friday, I do have a, a tentative uh, schedule for uh, Angel Martin to interview her. And um, hopefully, as I, we said, Brenda will, will, will interview you down the road. And anybody else, uh, if someone doesn't come forward, then I'll try to pursue you. But uh, it'd be nice if people would volunteer. So again, thanks, uh, Brother Daryl, and to the whole congregation. Uh, bless you all. In the name of our great Savior, God, Jesus.